Thank you for choosing this resource by Creflo and Taffy Dollar. Our goal is to provide an understanding of God's grace and empower change. Now listen to the gospel taught with simplicity and understanding and watch it change your life. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Now notice what he says, in whom God, in whom the God of this world, now who's the God of this world? Small g. Satan is the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now think about that. He blinds the mind of people who don't believe. He blinds their mind. Why do you blind their minds? How, how does he blind their minds? With philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. He keeps you blind by, by giving you the wrong philosophy. And I don't know if you've, when's the last time you met a person who didn't believe, but if you talk to the person who didn't believe, look at their thinking. And if, you're, if, if, if you can sit down and talk to them and show them through Scripture and change the way they believe, they'll get saved easy. It's just their way of belief that's kept them blind. So he's blinding people's minds through philosophy, has them thinking all of these other things, and he says he wants to keep their minds blind. Why? What is he trying to keep from their mind? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ. He don't want them to hear this gospel of grace this gospel of unmerited favor, this gospel of us being new create creations in Christ Jesus, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, now notice, I saw this. You know, after you go over some things over and over again, you start seeing stuff on a weekly basis. Here's what I saw. He's blinding their minds so they won't believe, so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look at what he's trying to stop, the image of God from shining unto them. He don't want them to know about the image of God. There's something that he's trying. See, here is the good news that he's trying to keep from them. Here's the good news he's trying to keep from them, that we are now in Christ. He does not want people to know that they can now live life in Christ. Go with me to the book of... Uh, I'll go back to it, but let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. The, the, the light, he wants to keep people blind to, the, to the, the, the issue of identity. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are, have become new. He doesn't want people to know. He wants them to be, stay blind to the fact that if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. He wants them to think, no, if you got to do something about your behavior in order to qualify to be a new creature. He don't want them to know it is as simple as if you're in Christ, you are a new creature. Now, let me back up for just a moment. If you'll make reference to Genesis chapter 3, I want to say very plainly, my wife said something, said something to me yesterday. She said, sometimes you go all around the bush to explain something. You get excited about all the little details. Go in a straight line sometime. So I'm going to go in a straight line tonight. And the straight line is the devil wants to attack your identity and stop you from realizing who you are. All of your power, all of everything that God has given to you is all invested in you believing the identity that you have now in Christ Jesus. Everything about your life is, is, is and the success of it is founded in your identity in Christ. You, 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 you seeing healing manifest is invested in your identity in Christ. You seeing deliverance manifest is all invested in your identity in Christ. You seeing your prosperity manifest is, is invested all in your identity in Christ. So now if you were the devil, think about it. Stop them from realizing who they really are and you'll stop the fruit. Do something to the root and you'll never see the fruit. Do something to the root, the root of all of the fruit that we're wanting to see in our life is based in Christ. And somehow if the devil can mess our minds up where we can't see ourselves in Christ, where we won't believe that we're in Christ, that if somehow if we can doubt our identity and who we are like Adam and Eve did. Notice what happened to Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, Satan shows up in a serpent, and the most craftiest, subtle creature on the planet. And, and he begins to go after their identity through deception. He uses philosophy to, to, to go after their identity. And he asked, you know, Eve this question, you know, trying to get her to doubt who she was. 
you know, hath God said that you, you know, about the trees in the garden? She says, God said we can eat all the trees of the garden except that one right there. That, that, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because the day we eat that, then we'll, it, 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 well, Eve said, the day we eat it and touch it, we shall surely die. So Satan's got to mess with the philosophy. God said, if you eat it, you shall die. Eve said, if you eat it or touch it, you shall die. So she takes it off a degree, just enough to deceive people. So when she touched it and didn't die, she figured maybe she eat it, she won't die either. Well, that's what he's doing right now today, adding tradition that's not in the Word, just adding. And that's why the Bible says, I believe in Mark 7, 13, your traditions have made the Word of God of no effect. So he uses tradition to make the Word of no effect. Does everybody follow what I'm saying here? And so uh, he just comes out and just says to her, you know, you shall not surely die. God knows that the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you'll know the difference between good and evil, and you'll be like a God. The, look what he attacks. He attacks their identity. She was already like a God. You can't be no more like God than Adam and Eve were. They had immortality. They had on the coat of glory. You can't be any more like God like they were. And he stole their godhood. He stole their immortality. He stole their coat of glory through philosophy by stealing their confidence in their identity. They didn't receive that they were like God, so they pursued to try to do something to get what they already had. Boy, isn't that the law? Trying to do something to get what you already had. Trying to fast for 90 days to get healing that you already had. Trying to, trying to, trying to pray for 50 hours to get God to move, and he already has. That's Satan's plan throughout all this time to try to steal your identity from you, and you can't let that happen. He won with Adam and Eve, but then he tried the same thing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, he shows up in the wilderness to go after Jesus and immediately starts off to try to get Jesus to doubt who he was. If thou be the Son of God. And Jesus responded the way we should respond. It is written. Every time sickness comes on your body, you ought to say, it is written. By his stripes I'm healed. Every time there's a need that comes in your life, it is written. My God shall supply all of my needs. That's how you respond. And he responded with, it is written. He kept, the, the enemy kept saying, if thou be the son of God. And finally, Jesus won the battle and said, I am the Lord, your God. I have no doubt about who I am. I am God. Now, the score is one and one, okay? Satan was able to defeat Adam and Eve. He was not able to defeat Jesus. And now we're the tiebreaker. We're the tiebreaker. Hallelujah. Now, how many of you know he will not defeat us? Amen. We are the tiebreaker. Okay, so I guess in so many words, going in a straight line, Satan's after your identity, and your identity is in Christ. Now, let's go back to 2 Corinthians, and I want to take this a little farther tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 17. Our identity is in Christ. I, I, want, to, I want to deal with some practical things that we have to do to get that settled. This is probably not the first time you've heard that you're in Christ. It's probably not a time where you have not said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That, that's probably not new. But I can tell you what, what will be new, the fact that you, knowing that you got to meditate and focus on this until it comes automatic, until you really, really start walking like this, and then you're going to start seeing different results uh, than you've been seen before. So let's examine uh, who we are now in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be where? So notice that's the key there. If any man be in Christ. So we're not just talking about what well, you saved. and No, no, we're talking about men, any man, woman, black man, uh, Asian man. Any man that's in Christ is a new creature. So now that's talking about you being a new creature in Christ and the old you has passed away. You know, you say somebody died that they passed. So we're, ta we're trying to get rid of the old you and trying to get you to become aware of the new you that's in Christ. Well, here, here's what really, here's what's happening. The new you is, is in Christ. You, you, it, it, it's, it's you in Christ. 
Now, you in Christ means that you're dead in Christ, but you're alive in Christ. But everything about you is in Christ. Say out loud, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. Say, when I got born again, I got, born again. I got in Christ. I got in Christ. I'm, no I'm no longer in me, but me is in Christ. Me is in Christ. They're from a new species. All right, so I'm in Christ. Behold, all things are become new. So here is my identity. My identity is in Christ. My identity, say that out loud. I, my, identity my identity is in Christ. Is in Christ. Say it again. My identity, my identity is, in is in Christ. Say it one more time. My identity is in Christ. Say it one more time. My identity is in Christ. So Satan's attack is going to be to attack you in Christ. Now, I believe most likely he's going to try to get you to deal with yourself out of Christ. Yeah. I, I believe when it's when it time for you to be sick, you're going to forget that you're in Christ. I believe when, 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 when lack comes, you're gonna, you know, he's going to try to make you forget that you're in Christ. All of the things that are very easily dealt with in Christ if I can get you out of Christ, then you're going to start panic. You're going to start walking in fear. You're going to stay stressed out. You're going to, everything's going to seem like it's impossible because he's got to get you to live life outside of Christ. And your identity is not within you or who you are. Your identity is in Christ. Say, say it again. My identity is in Christ. My identity is in Christ. Say it again. My identity is in Christ. My identity is in now, now, so go, Mark, go to Mark chapter 1 and, and verse 14. So my identity is in Christ. Now, look at all the time in the New Testament. Look at all of the scriptures now as we go through the New Testament that's going to be dealing with that. Now, I, we're, 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 we're going to be uh, very precise tonight about what the New Testament, this covenant of graces, is, is all about. Uh, all the wonderful things Jesus has done for us, everything that uh, he's made available to us. Every time you make a step of faith, you're going to have the opposition coming your way. So I, in, a, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to warn you that what I'm teaching tonight is dangerous in a sense because as you step in faith in this, the enemy is going to be trying to meet you with opposition. Okay? But if you can, you, you can win over him, but if you'll endure the opposition, your life is going to go to another level. I, you, you hear what I'm saying? Your life is going to go to another level if you can endure opposition. Now, let's focus on some things now. Verse 14 says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the good news about the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 15. Uh, and here's what he was saying. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So he's preaching the kingdom of God. And look what he says. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Religiously, if you look at that, it's like, okay, well, you know, what is he saying? He's saying, say you're sorry and believe this good news. Say you're sorry and believe this good news. That's what religion teaches us. That's what I was taught the whole time. Say you're sorry, change the way you behave, and believe this good news. And, and I never questioned that. Change the way you behave. You know, if you're partying and if you're, if, you're, if you're having fornication and if you're acting like a fool, change the way you behave, repent, and believe the good news. Okay, may I dig into that a little bit to show you that that's, that's not exactly what he is saying here? I want you to look at verse 15 in the Amplified Bible as we add precision to this so you can see exactly what's going on here. Now, in the Amplified Bible, he says in, in verse 15, and saying the appointed period of time is fulfilled, it's completed, the kingdom of God is at hand, it's done. Repent, have a change of mind, which issues in regret for past sins. So if you have a change of mind, you'll, you'll you'll regret the past sins. And then once you change your mind, you're going to have a change of conduct. Okay? You're going to have a change of conduct for uh, the better, and you're going to believe, and you're going to rely, and you're going to adhere to the good news about the gospel. So now listen, look at what's going on. Repent, believe, and then there's the gospel right here. 
Well, let's first of all deal with what real repentance is. I thought, and, and this, is, this is correct, repentance is a 180 degree turn. You're turning your back on what you used to face. But most people say when you repent, they say that means you have a change, you change your behavior. Now listen to me, you saw in the Amplified where it says repent, change your mind. Repentance means to change your mind. A changed behavior is the fruit of real repentance. When you change your mind, you'll change your behavior, okay? But, but repentance doesn't mean a change of behavior. Repentance means change your mind. You can't change your behavior until you change your mind. Are you following what I'm saying? So he said, change your mind and believe. All right, change your mind and believe and, and this, this gospel of grace. Change your mind and believe. See, whatever, whatever my mindset is, that's what my belief set is going to be. I'm going to believe what I think. You know that's true. I'm going to believe what I think. There are people all over the world that they believe in the wrong thing because they're thinking the wrong thing. So my thinking is going to, go, going to govern my believing. So if I'm going to believe right, what do I have to do? I got to think right. What happens when I think, what happens to my belief when I think wrong? I'm going to believe wrong. All right, if I'm believing wrong, it's because of what? So now you see where he says, repent. Change your mind. Why? Because you're believing wrong. You're believing wrong about the kingdom of God. You're believing wrong about all the things you ever heard. Repent and believe the gospel. What gospel? This gospel about you being in Christ. You, this gospel about this unmerited favor. Don't you know that's the grace of God for us to be in Christ? What did you do to deserve to be in Christ? What did you do to deserve to be born again and in Christ? Now, here's the deal. When I say, when he said, change your mind, I, I, I ask about what? Change my mind about what? Now, if you're not careful, religion will have you going all over the place. Well, change your mind about Daniel in the lion's den. Well, change your mind about, change your mind about what? We have to stay in, in the context of what this, what this whole gospel is about. Change your mind about what? Your identity. Your identity. Because he's talking about you in Christ. Change your mind about this identity. Change your mind about the weak, humanly person that you used to be outside of Christ. And now that the kingdom is at hand and the gospel has been made available, change your mind about who you think you are. You are now in Christ. Change your mind about that. Change your mind about that. I'm in Christ. I changed my mind. I'm in Christ. I, and, and, and now in Christ, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Before I was in Christ, I was weak. I was depressed. I was in fear. I, things were impossible. Change your mind about who you are and believe that you are in Christ. And then he says, this gospel that has been made available to you, you're going to see it like never before. This gospel that, that, that's been given to you, it's free. Hallelujah. Your healing's free. Your, your deliverance is free. Your prosperity is free. Jesus did it all. So change your mind and you'll see that you have a right to this gospel because you're in Christ. And anything that Christ got, you in him, you got. But none of that can become available if you don't change your mind about your identity. Change your mind about your identity. Change your mind about your identity. And believe, believe this identity in Christ. Believe this identity in Christ. Change your mind about your identity and believe this identity in Christ. Does everybody see that? Yes. So you have, you have the change of mind equals the right belief, and then now you can bear fruit. Change your mind, believe right, bear fruit. Oh, uh, yeah, nah. uh, yeah, I think this is a good time to say this, and I'll explain it in detail later. Change your mind about your identity. I am in Christ. I am in the Christ tree. I am in the Christ root, all right? I am in the Christ tree. I'm in the Christ root. He's in me. I'm in him. Now, I am going to bear fruit of who I'm in. The same fruit that Jesus bears, I'm going to bear because I'm in him. The same fruit that Jesus bear, I'm going to bear because I'm in him. Hallelujah. And I believe that I'm in him, right? 
So watch, look at the fruit. The fruit, the branches bear the fruit. You say, say out loud, the Bible says, I am the branch. We're the branch, right? Jesus said, I'm the vine, you the branch. So the, the fruit shows up on the, on, the, on, on the branch, right? Okay, so if you in Christ, hallelujah, and he's the root now to your life, every fruit that Jesus was able to, to bear on the earth, you're going to be able to do it. Somebody says, well, does that include walking on water? Well, check it out. Somebody says, well, Jesus was the only one that walked on water. No, Peter was a man just like you and I. Glory to God. Y'all need to see what's going on. And as long as Peter, would you, would you jot that down and have me to go back to that? I'm just going to say this, but I need, to, I need to dig into it. As long as Peter kept his eye on Christ, he was able to do exactly what Christ did. He was in Christ. He was in Christ. Now, here's, here's the thing I want to preach on tonight. We're talking about you being transformed. How do we transform you from the fruit of the old identity to the fruit of this new identity. Transformation, real transformation. I want your life to be transformed from sickness to healing, from lack to abundance, from bondage to, to deliverance. You're in Christ, so you have a right to everything that Christ has. Christ has deliverance. He has prosperity. He has healing. He has those things. You're in him. You have it too. Amen. Amen. You, you're, say, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. All, that is Christ All that is Christ is mine. Is mine. Let me show you what's literally going on. Now that you're in Christ, he is now living his life through you. So in a sense, he's allowing you to live his life. Hello. Christ's life being lived through you. So everything he did you now can do. His ministry is not over with. He's continuing it through you. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now, so I said, Lord, okay, I see that. I get that. Real nice, real spiritual, real good stuff to shout about. Help me to teach a practical protocol to see this transformation. How do I... What do, what do we do? So what do we do? How do I cooperate with my new identity so that I can see the fruit? Right. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that I, I, I don't want to just go around, well, I'm in Christ, I'm in, I'm in Christ, I'm in Christ. Is there something I need to be cooperating with to see what I already have to, in a, in a, to take advantage of the fruit that I already have? If, if I'm in Christ, may I experience this life? May I, may, I want to experience this life. So if I'm doing something to keep this experience back, what is it? And there's only one, there's one word that came up. Here's that one word. Say focus. focus. Say it again, focus. focus. Real transformation takes place through focus. All right, now I'm going to deal with you as pr in, in a practical way, very practical. What is it that as a Christian, what I need to be doing? All right, now check this out. Dear God, if somebody would have taught me this 35 years ago, I'd have been walking on pools right now. Pool water, I'd have been walking on pool water, I guarantee you. I feel like I'm starting this with, with everybody else because I, I, I knew this. But I'm, you know, the Bible says be careful about, you know, letting certain things slip. The thing that would always slip in my life is I would forget that I'm in Christ. Now, I'd be a Christian and, and carry things, but sometimes I would tolerate things because I'm not aware I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. And if you lose that awareness or if you lose that focus that you're in Christ, sometimes you put up with stuff you don't have to put up with. Sometimes when, when you need to have the right response when the wrong thing happening. You follow what I'm saying? Your emotions can become so dominating in your life. They seem so real and so powerful. You wonder, is there anything other than this that I can overcome? And yet there is something in Christ that is so much more powerful than your emotions. But you have to train yourself. Ooh, Lord. All right, so let's deal with this, this focus deal. Whatever you focus on the most, that's what you're going to give strength to. You've heard me say that. Whatever you focus on the most, 
That's what you give strength to. Now, I hope I said that like weeks ago because I knew I was going to have to come down there preaching this. So, I, try, you know, if you've been here at least, you know, at least 15 years, I'll plant stuff, you know, five months before I preach it just to get it in you. Say this out loud. Whatever I focus on, that's what I give strength to. All right, what if you focus on your weakness? Your weakness is going to be strong, okay? But whatever you focus on, that's what you're going to give strength to. If you focus on the fear, you're going to give strength to fear, right? If you focus on your faith and word, you're going to give strength to that. And when problems come, we have a tendency to focus on the negative, that's called worry, more than we do focus on, on, on the things of God. Now, follow me very carefully with this. I've, I've, I've not taught this before because I've not ever been able to teach it. Not an ability to teach it, but it, it could have never been heard because I didn't understand the gospel of grace enough to teach you the gospel of grace, so I wouldn't have been able to share this with you. And, and now for the first time in, in, in all of these years of ministry, I get to say some stuff that is just, I'm so excited about saying it, I need to shut up and just go ahead and say it before my time is up. All right, now go to Colossians chapter 1, 27, 28 now. Now stay with me. Stay on this train with me. All right, now let's, let's go very cautious here. Ready? To, now, now look at what you're reading now. Let's read it. Let's read it together. Verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery amongst the Gentiles. All right, now, now, so I'm going to ask you the question. What is the mystery of the riches of the glory? The glory of the Lord. What is the, what's the, what's the mystery here? What's the mystery? If you keep reading, you'll see it. What's the mystery? The mystery is Christ in you. Isn't, it, isn't that a mystery? Yeah. How Christ can be in you. That's a mystery. Christ is in me. Whoo! Say it. Say, Christ is in me. Christ is in me. The day you got born again, Jesus Christ now lives in you. Now, come on. Somebody got to ask the question one day, how could that be? It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Christ is in me. Say it. Christ is in me. Now, how many of you believe that? Amen. Now, that's the thing Satan through philosophy is going to, he's trying to just, he's trying to say, this is, there's no way Christ can be in you. You know, in the last 50 years, he's almost been successful in getting people to question the virgin birth. How can a virgin give birth to somebody? It's, it's years. It's, he, it put, so, the mystery of Christ being in you. All right, now look at the next part, he says. Now that Christ is in you, what kind of what hope do you have? Hope of glory. It's almost like Christ is in me, so what is to be expected as a result of Christ being in me? The hope of glory. Now, what does hope mean? An earnest expectation of something, right? So the, the, he answers to something. Christ being in me is the reason why I can expect Glory. The reason why I can expect glory. Now, I can tell you this. Glory is the manifestation of, now we got to figure out of what. We know it's the manifestation of good, but specifically, what is the glory that we can expect as a result of Christ being in us? Is everybody following me now? All right, now, go to verse 28. This Christ whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. How, how can you, hold on, how can I present every man perfect in Christ? That's the only way, right? There's no way you can present any man perfect. This, in fact, any man that's not in Christ has no potential of ever being perfect. But he says here that every man that's in Christ can be presented perfect. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's powerful. Because you and I are here today and we can all declare we are perfect in Christ. We are perfect in Christ. Say that out loud. Say it again. So he is saying something here. In both verses you hear in Christ. The mystery is in Christ. And then the second one you hear, we're perfect in Christ. Now, if we're going to focus, here's our focus. Our focus is Christ and Christ in you. My focus is Christ and Christ in me. My focus is Christ and Christ in me. My focus is Christ and Christ in me. I, I, I'm asking that after tonight that you will focus on this one. I'm not asking you to focus on the whole Bible. I'm asking you right now every day to take some time and focus on Christ is in me. Christ, say it, say it, Christ is in me. Say it again. Say it again. Christ is in me. That's the focus. That's the focus. Now think about what religion's done to all of us. We, we have never been sure on just what is it that we need to be focusing on. A, born, a Christian that gets saved for the first time, he wants to know, what do I do next? Well, I renew my mind and I focus on Christ and Christ in me. Christ and Christ in me. All right, now watch this. Okay, so we preach Christ and we're not ourselves. I don't preach myself anymore because I'm dead in Christ. I preach Christ and not ourselves. We preach Christ and not ourselves. We are perfect in him. All right, now I'm going sh to show you something. I, I want you to write this down. Uh, Self-occupied. versus Christ-occupied. Self-occupied versus Christ-occupied. Now, for the most of us, we spend most of our time being occupied with ourself. Occupied with our bills, occupied with our children, occupied with our problems, occupied with our hurt, occupied with our situation, occupied with what we ain't got, occupied with what we ain't get, occupied why we ain't get it, occupied, we are self-occupied. And if there's one characteristic of our country, it would be self-occupied. And yet we're still in the church and we are self-occupied occupied. Now, what happens when you are self-occupied? Fear, stress, pain, panic. Look at all the things that happen when you are self-occupied. Wow. Wow. Just being occupied with yourself. Every time you feel depressed, I want, you to, I want you to just look at yourself and say, I must be self-occupied. <laughs> every time you feel bad, every time you feel angry, every time you feel afraid, every time you feel vulnerable, I just want you to just remind yourself, I'm self-occupied. If you're sitting around the house sad, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, how come I ain't got friends, what about this? Say, ooh, it sounds like I'm self-occupied. I am occupied with myself. I am at the center. That's real, isn't it? Versus Christ occupied? What happens when I become so occupied with Christ? Sin suffers the death blow when you make much of Jesus. Sin suffers the death blow when you make much of Jesus because it's very difficult to sin when you're not occupied with yourself. Think about what happens when you focus on Christ and Christ in you. You're so occupied with Christ. What can the devil do? You're too occupied with Christ. You're too occupied with Christ. It is so difficult to walk in fear. It is so difficult to walk in pain. Do you know when you become Christ-occupied, you're happy? 
You're happy because you're occupied with Christ? It's a matter of focus. I wish somebody would have told me, spend your beginning years as a Christian being occupied with Christ and not yourself. And every time you see something about yourself come up, get occupied with Christ. See, see, here's what I've been doing lately, and it's been working. Every time something comes up, I say, I'm in Christ. I get Christ occupied. I'm in Christ, it'll be all right. I'm in Christ, an answer will come. I'm in Christ, a provision will come. I'm in Christ, everything's going to be all right. I'm in Christ, it's, it's going to be great. Hallelujah, praise God. I'm in Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm in Christ. All is well because I'm in Christ. What happens? I'm immediately, I'm, I'm, right now I'm, discipl I'm disciplining myself as a person in training to, to understand I'm in Christ. So when issues happen, I'm not in me, me dead. I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. See, there's something, you know, we don't want to address these issues. We want to, we, you know, well, you know, that doesn't sound spiritual. Yeah, but the negative stuff you suffer, I I'm telling you what you're doing. You're self-occupied. And you got to become Christ-occupied. And, and I have to teach people how to do that. I got to teach people the practical that is involved in self-occupied versus Christ-occupied. Listen, everybody in here, if we, if, if we were to become, if we are self-occupied all the time, everybody got a problem. Everybody got a problem. Everybody got an issue. Everybody feels some kind of way. That's because you would be self-occupied. But check it out. What if everybody would become Christ-occupied? Imagine what church would be like if people spent all week long being Christ-occupied versus coming to church self-occupied. When you come to church self-occupied, I can't do nothing for you. But here's another thing. The Holy Ghost can't even help you because you got yourself at a center. You can't even see Christ. One of the, the things that God could say to us being Christ-occupied, one of what we could see if we were Christ-occupied, one of, the, one of the, the entrepreneur ideas, the, the revelation that would come if we were Christ-occupied, the answers that would come if we were Christ-occupied, the healing that would come if we were Christ-occupied. I had a pain in my body. I could not figure out where that came from. Everything in my body is doing well except for this one area of my body. And, 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 and the Lord said, that area continues to hurt you. I said, yes, sir. He says, you're so occupied with it. He said, didn't you learn that with your vocal cords? I said, well, I thought that was just looking at stuff. No, it's all about where you're occupying your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know it wasn't even a day hardly where I've just shifted my attention on Christ and became more occupied with him? I haven't even noticed the pain. And then I got a revelation. Your posture's bad. Correct it. Yeah. Wow. All being occupied with Christ. <laughs> Are y'all getting anything out of that? Yeah. You remember the woman at the well? Go to John chapter 14, chapter 4, John 4, and let's look at 25, 26, and 29. Here's a woman who was so occupied with all her stuff occupied with all of her husbands, occupied with getting the water, occupied with all this stuff that's going on. Jesus shows up and he begins to minister to this woman. And she became so occupied with Jesus that everybody she saw, she was talking about Jesus. Look at verse 25. And Jesus came to her. Jesus knew about all of her husbands. She, he knew about her past. He knew about all that. She was so occupied with her past. Jesus, people have to realize what's happening. Jesus went out of his way to have an encounter with this woman at the well. He went the long way around to his destination so he could have an encounter with this woman. And with all of her past and all of her problems, he calls her into the ministry. Wow! Someone says, what? He calls a woman with her past into the ministry. And he goes to the woman and says, I know about your past, but I'm still calling you into a ministry. Oh, look at that grace. He's just saying, I can't use you because you're so occupied with your past. That's right. That's right. And the woman, after she heard all of this, in verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know uh, that, that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, and when he is come, he'll tell us all things. Look at verse 26. And Jesus said unto her, 
I that speak unto thee am he. I'm the one you're talking about. And look at verse 29. Comes, and she, 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 she encountered Jesus and all this stuff happened. And, and so she went to the city. She said, come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Everywhere she, she was so occupied with her encounter with Christ that she went and told everybody, this, come see a man. Honey, I'm telling you, if you'll stop being so occupied with your past and occupied with your problem and occupied with all of the stuff you done did wrong and occupied with all your sin and just get yourself occupied with Christ. There'll be a calling that you can enter into. Hallelujah. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Now watch this. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Now let me ask you something. Think with me for a moment. He says, we're all beholding in a glass, or another translation says, says the mirror, we behold the glory of the Lord. All right, now, now let me ask you a question now. What is the glory of the Lord? Christ. That's the glory of God. Christ is the express image of his very nature. That's the glory of God. The, the glory of God has been manifested in the Christ that we live in. So he says every time we look into the mirror, we see Christ, God's glory. Now watch this. And every time we look in the mirror and see Christ, we're going to be changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He says, so the Spirit of the Lord is going to change us in that image. Now, let me show you what he's talking about. The Word of God is that glass. The Word of God is that mirror. Now, listen to what he says. This is so amazing to me. He says, when you look into the Word of God, when you who are in Christ look into the Word of God, you're going to see Christ. And when you... Let me show you what I wrote down. He says, as, see, as you study, as you study in the Word, you open the Word up, as you study His unconditional love, as you study Christ and His unconditional love, then you're going to be transformed into the Christ that has unconditional love. As you study Christ and His righteousness, then you're going to be transformed into that righteousness because you're in Christ. As you study in the Word Christ and His forgiveness, then you're going to be transformed into a person that forgives. In other words, now that you have the root of Christ in you, you can produce the fruit of Christ on the outside of you. And so every time you open the Bible up and read about Christ and all of the characteristics and the fruit that He bore, you're going to become that. And guess who's going to make sure you become that? As you look at Christ in the Word, you're going to be changed into that very image by the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Ghost is going to transform you into the image you look at. You're going to see the reflection of Christ. My God, this is the stuff that Paul said, I have lots to say to you, but you can't bear it there. Because Christ is in you and you are now in Christ, when you look at the Word, you see His reflection, that's your reflection. That's how you look in Him. And the Holy Ghost says, what you see in the Word, I'm going to transform you into that. The Holy Ghost is taking, accepting the responsibility to change you into the image. He just needs you to behold the image. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to behold Christ. Time to behold Christ. As you behold Christ, the Holy Ghost is going to change you into what you behold. So if there's something practical I can tell you to do, start beholding Christ in the Word. Look at Him into the Word. See Him in the Word. See righteousness in the Word. See, uh, let, me, let me show you something. Go to, um, yeah, I wrote it down, Luke 23, 34, and then Acts chapter 7 and 59. I'm going to show you an illustration where Stephen, 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 he was looking at Jesus, spent time with Jesus, and he was transformed 
beholding Jesus. He started doing some of the same thing. Look at what Jesus did in Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So when Jesus was going through his suffering, Jesus said, forgive them. Now look at Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60. Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60. And you'll see now how he is now being transformed into that same image that he beheld. And they stoned Stephen and, uh, and calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now look what he said in verse 60. And he kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Where did he get that from? What do you get for giving somebody that's stoning you? What happened was, as he beheld Jesus, it was transformed into that same image. In Jesus now, that was just like Jesus doing it all over again. Because there's now a man who's been transformed into that image. It's not just being transformed into the image where you can forgive people, but it's being transformed into the image where you can heal people, where you can cast that devil out of people, where you can work miracles, where you can, you, you know where the money is to handle things. He, he found it in the mouth of a fish. He's saying, my life will be lived through you. And your job, the only thing I'm needing you to do is behold me. Behold me. And, and, and the sanctification that Jesus is, is, is that the sanctification and holiness Jesus is your sanctification. Jesus is your holiness, but he moved in you. So if Jesus moved in you, then sanctification moved in you, then holiness moved in you, then righteousness moved in you. And if you want to be transformed into all that you have in you, behold him. Behold him. Now, now I, want to, I want to come another route here, and I want to show you something. I am asking you to exercise. Colossians chapter 1, 27 talks about that we're in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 130, I want you to look at that real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 130. Your sanctification, your righteousness, your holiness is a person. Your sanctification, sanctification is a person, it's Jesus. Holiness is a person, it's Jesus. Look at here, verse 30, 31. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. Look at there. Where are you? Where are you? In Christ. Who of God has made unto us, and you're in Christ Jesus who has made what? Wisdom. So we're in wisdom, right? right? You're in Christ Jesus who has been made unto us what? Righteousness. So you're, you're in righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. So notice you're in Jesus, you're in Christ, but you're in righteousness, you're in wisdom. So righteousness is a person, and wisdom is a person. Sanctification is a person. Redemption is a person. You are in Christ, therefore you also have access to all this. Go to verse 31. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Look at what you can manifest as long as you're in Jesus. All right, now, so, so what do I need to do? All right, now, I'm going to show you something. This is very, very interesting here. Uh, you know, Christ is being formed in us, right? Galatians chapter 4 and 19. Now, Lord, give me wisdom on how to share this. Psalms 1, and I'll share these two scriptures and, and I'll stop. Psalms 1 and uh, verses 1 through 3. I, I hope I hadn't completely lost you. You, you with me? Uh, <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, I'm trying to show you have the Christ in you. We want to get the Christ out of you. I'm saying here's practically what you do. You have to now get in the Word and behold Christ in the Word. Behold righteousness. Behold sanctification. Behold it and know that you're in that. It's not something you're looking at and saying, I can't have that. It's something you already have. You're in that. So how do I get it out? As I behold it, as I look at it, then the Holy Spirit's going to manifest it in my life. Now, I'm going to show you a very practical thing. We're simply talking about exercising your focus until it becomes, we're talking about training now, right? We're talking about training now. All right, now watch this. Um, verse 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the un ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So he says, you're blessed if you don't walk in the way of ungodliness. All right, now look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. The, now he's talking about the godly, right? 
His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now look what the godly do. They meditate day and night. Verse 3, what are the godly like? And he shall be like a tree. The godly are going to be like a tree that's planted. It's, when you meditate the word day and night, you're going to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. And you bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And what, notice he didn't say your fruit because you're not in you. This is a shadow of what was to come. And his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Look what he says in verse 4. The ungodly are not so. All right? So verse 2 and 3 was talking about the godly. Meditate. No, what, what, do, what, do, what, what does the godly, godliness does what? Meditate in the Word. And, and when he's, he's, he's compared to a tree that's by water, and whatever he does, he's, it's going to prosper. He says, but the ungodly are not so. What is he what he's saying about the ungodly? They don't meditate in the Word. You see that? Yeah. All right, now, let me show you a scripture that people had no idea about this thing, man. This is my last scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7 through 8. 1 Timothy 4. What does it have to do with anything we're talking about tonight? Watch this. 1 Timothy 4, 7. But refuse profane and old wise fables. Look at the philosophy of the devil now. He says, refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. No, so what's the implication? What's the implication? When you are listening to wise fables and profane doctrine and bad philosophy, you are exercising yourself in ungodliness. When you are focused on things that go against the Word, you're exercising yourself in ungodliness. But he said, exercise rather yourself under godliness. All right, watch the next verse. Verse 8. For bodily exercise profit little. Now, let me say this. I've heard people say, well, you know, bodily exercise has no profit in it. No, that's not what Scripture says. Body, he said, it, it has a little profit when compared to to godly exercise. Bodily exercise has some profit, he says, but exercising, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now, now is, and that which is to come. He says, now, there's something about exercising yourself unto godliness that's, that's, that has a promise for right, right where you are now and, and, and in, in the life that is to come. All right. So we just, we made a distinction in Psalms 1, how ungodly people, how, how do you exercise in ungodliness and how you exercise in godliness? Well, how do you exercise in godliness? Meditate the Word. How do you exercise in ungodliness? Meditating the philosophies of the world. What is he saying? Exercise. Meditate in that Word day and night. Joshua 1 and 8 says, if you'll meditate in the Word day and night, you will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. Meditating in God's Word makes you like that tree that's planted by the rivers of water and that you will bear fruit in, in His season and whatsoever you do will prosper. Godliness, exercising in godliness is simple. Meditating God's Word. Meditating God's Word. The Holy Ghost is going to help you. And same thing he was saying in 2 Chronicles, Corinthians. As you see, open the Bible and see in the mirror of God's Word. As you see Christ and His righteousness in the Word, the Holy Ghost will cause you to become that. As you see deliverance in that Word, the Holy Ghost will cause you. As you see miracles in the Word, the Holy Ghost will cause that same thing. As you see people getting delivered by Christ, everything you see Christ do in the Word. He says, meditate on that, and the Holy Ghost will cause you to become that which you meditate in. But it's not just meditating on things so you can get it to happen. Meditate on who you are in Christ. Exercise what you have. You know, I have a muscle. I have the same bicep muscle that everybody else in here has. We have all the same set of muscles in here. but I may never see your bicep muscle. Why? Because you don't exercise it. This doesn't mean you don't have one. It just means you don't exercise it. You have Christ in you. 
I may never see him. Why? Because you don't exercise. There's no meditating in the words of the Holy Spirit can cause it to come to pass. Exercise yourself in godliness. Why? So we can behold the fruit. Well, Brother Dollar, in that self-effort, no, what this is, is getting your mind to, co this is cooperation with the Holy Ghost. As we behold Christ, the Spirit of God says, he will make you, he will cause you to be changed. Check it out. I'm not, this is not even on me. This is on the Holy Ghost. Check out what he's telling me to do. Behold Christ. Well, how do I behold Christ? What am I going to look under my arm and see if I can see him in there? How am I going to behold Christ? By opening up the mirror of the Word. And as I see him in the Word, and I meditate on it, and I say, I can do this, and I meditate on this, and I say, I can do this. And I see, everything I see Jesus doing, I say, I can do this. And then somebody going to say one day, who you think you are? Jesus, and the day you say yes is the day that you have finally gotten it. I can do this. What, you, you, listen, listen to the scripture you say when you feel bold enough at church. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, by meditating in that word, you're changed into that image. The Holy Ghost is going to transform you into Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By the Spirit, remember, you're changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. What do I do? Behold Jesus. I behold Jesus. I behold Jesus. And, and every time something happens in my life, I behold Jesus. And every time something goes on, I behold Jesus. And every time something bad happens, I behold Jesus. Until I can't, I can't see myself without seeing myself in him. That the only way I can see my life is to see my life in him. If anyone in here if anyone at the sound of my voice will accept what I am teaching tonight, you will, you will move into a whole new dimension of operation. I tell you, you won't be able to be the same. No more self-occupied, you're more Christ-occupied. You're beholding him. Holy Spirit's changing you into what you behold. You start exercising godliness. You see how all this is coming together. You exercise yourself unto godliness. You become like that tree. You become like that tree. Well, what tree do you have in you, Christ? And you bear fruit in his season. And whatsoever you do, it prospers. Maybe I don't know every scripture in the Bible, but I know who I am. I know who I am. Don't you get it? Okay, so, so what I'm saying is, instead of us walking out of church tonight and say, wonderful message, we walk out of church tonight and say, okay, I see how I need to cooperate. Here's what I'm going to be thinking. I'm in Christ. Here's what I'm going to be thinking. I'm beholding Christ. See, that's, my, that's, that's, why, that's how you, you'll see holiness in my life because I behold Christ. I don't have to try to be holy. I just behold Christ and I, I become holy. I, I, don't have to, I don't try to be righteous. I just behold Christ and you see righteousness. God, I don't try to be sanctified. I behold Christ and, and that happens. And, and I exercise through meditating on Christ in me. And I'm in him. I tell you, I, I, I know without a doubt this is why the enemy has tried to kill me. This is why the enemy tries to, has tried to discredit me. This is why the engines went out over the Pacific Ocean. All of this to try to stop a revelation. 
but it's out now. So now let's be the infallible proof. And when people look at your life and ask, what's happening? Don't try to go through all the scripture and all that kind of stuff. Say, I'm focused on Christ in me. The hope of the manifestation of Christ flowing out of me. So now what happens? Somebody says, well, I, 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 I thought it would take time. I thought it would be a process for you to really see sanctification. I thought it would be a process for you to see righteousness. I thought it would be a process for you to see holiness in my life. No, no, no. I'm, I already got all that. I am all that now. I am all of that now. It's not, a, it's not a process for me to become righteous. It's not a process for me to become holy. It's not a process for me to become sanctified. The day I got Christ and got in him, I now am all of those things. I am all of those things. I am righteous right now because I'm in Christ. I'm sanctified now because I'm in Christ. Are you understand? I'm holy because I'm in Christ. I am perfect because I'm in Christ. You know, I even thought, well, it's going to take time before I become perfect. And I even said, you know, I'm not going to be perfect until I see Christ. I am perfect right now. I am in Christ. Amen. All right. Now, so what is the process now? What, what is it that takes process? What takes process is all that's in me to bear fruit out of me so you can see it. It's, I am righteous, now the process of what's in me working itself out. I am holy already, and day by day as I exercise myself in this, you're going to see holiness. You're going to see righteousness. That's why my behavior cannot determine my identity because I won't be righteous until my behavior lines up with righteousness. But my behavior can't line up with righteousness until I'm first of all righteous. The fruit doesn't give birth to the root. The root gives birth to the fruit. You are rooted and grounded in love. And God is love. What has Satan tried to keep from you? Why, why, why disrupt your identity? Because if he can get you not to believe that, then none of that will flow out into your life. Because your bad behavior or your misbehavior will tell you you're not that. And that becomes the attack on your identity. It's, it's what you do and don't do that attacks who the word says you are. And by faith, you've got to believe I am the righteousness of God. So that righteousness will be born as a manifestation in your life. So that holiness will be born as a manifestation. I am holy now. I am prosperous now. Don't have a penny to your name right now. But the day you believe you're in Christ and you're prosperous, prosperity flows out of you. It flows out of you. Thank you for watching this teaching. We pray that this message has encouraged and empowered you to pursue God's best for your life. His grace is the pathway to living an abundant life. For additional life-changing resources or to learn about becoming a 2020 Vision Partner, visit our website at www.creflodollarministries.org or call toll-free 1-866-877-7683. Thank you for your support of Creflo Dollar Ministries. People like you change the world.